I'm, um, I really think it's important that, uh, that we actually consider that, uh, I mean, grievances go both ways. Um, that uh, uh, if we're willing to consider the fragmentation also of the opponents of the, of, the, of the Houthis, we need also to integrate that there can be potentially, um, you know, fragmentation within the Houthis. Uh, currently, these do not appear because I think there's this kind of rally around the flag, which is, uh, which is happening. And they, they, as we say in French, you know, they have, their, they have wind, wind in their wings. Huh? Uh, so, I mean, uh, as time goes by, they appear to be stronger and stronger. And I think this is, this is something, something which, is, which is appealing, but uh, it should not, uh, in any way, not uh, make us forget that also um, things are not as ideological as, well as we, we think they might be. Uh, they might be linked also to sort of grievances, uh, which have built up over the years and which can uh, can develop and re-emerge, uh, you know, quite quite rapidly. And I think this will be will be important also to sort of mitigate uh, mitigate uh, um, the, the kind of religious ideology which appears to be uh, to be building uh, currently. The other thing that I wanted to point uh, uh, to, to, to 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 stress. Uh, deals with uh, the current fate of Salafism. I think it's uh, it's interesting to to see that uh, uh, a number of the leaders uh, are being uh, you know are in a quest of um, you know they they were busy uh, being uh, appearing to be authentic before and now they want to appear as uh, respectable uh, and this is something which is really being uh, being uh, um, favored. By regional actors, and I think it will have a quite quite significant uh, uh, um, repercussions in the, in the future to actually integrate them in the in the political field, uh, which has uh, both uh, positive and uh, negative uh, uh, dimensions because uh, having them in the political field can mean that some people will regard them as a uh, as sort of traitors or or people who are not pure enough anymore. Uh, but uh, but I think it's uh, it's really uh, significant that they are, you know, being uh, pushed as uh, as respectable actors, and, uh, and this is probably something to look at. Uh, yeah. Okay. I cannot work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One one important thing about the Salafis, and last summer I did a, an extensive research on the Salafi groups in the West Coast and the South that are you know that are backed by the UAE that are fighting on the you know kind of anti houthi bloc. Um, only the leaders are Salafis. The members are largely 98% are ordinary Southerners who are not Salafis. So I think, I think the problem of, of militarizing the Salafis is kind of overblown. Um, so and I, I agree with the, you know I agree with with what Laura, uh, Laurent just said. Um, with the Houthis, um, I think saying that they are um, you know anti-imperialist with the political agenda has some you know truth but it's not entirely accurate Houthi's discourse is heavily heavily religious if you look at most of what comes out of Houthi leaders statements videos media propaganda over the past year particularly over the past couple of months towards Marib it's heavily religious their battle in Marib is against atheists and they're fighting the Jews in Marib. And if they pick up rock, there would be Jews underneath that rock. Um, they, yes, I, I would say like, you know, 10% of what they say is anti-imperialism, um, but only because I think, you know, their allies in the region are anti-America, anti but 90% of their discourse towards their internal, uh, you know, opponents is heavily religious. And people talk about, you know, sectarianism and how, you know, the, the incorporation of Salafis and the kind of radical, whatever Sunni uh, groups is, is creating um, um, sectarianism, but it's actually Houthis who started sectarianism because when they moved to Baida in 2014 and took Baida, they labeled their opponents as ISIS. So they, and, and when they went there, they installed in every place, they, they installed their own preachers and they forced uh, their slogan on the local people. Um, and so that triggered a reaction, which is extreme. So I think it goes both ways. And I think to only blame the Saudis and the Salafis and the Sunni groups for instigating sectarianism because they have a, you know, a religious anti-Houthi sentiment is only one side of the picture. And I think we, we need to look at what the Houthi discourse uh, as well. 
Thank you. Stephen, did you uh, want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, Noel, if you'd let me um, uh, say something, I'd like to hear what uh, Luca would say in response, and maybe Ahmed uh, and Lauren as well, if you could, and Manuel as well, if you could come back in, Manuel. But, but everybody knows that the sectarian issue was not uh, prominent in Yemen, right? Um, I would say, you know, 2014, even the beginning of the war in 2015, it really wasn't an issue. But the problem is that the longer the conflict goes on, right, the, the more uh, grievances there are on the ground, you know, the, the feelings harden. And so the risk is that these ideologies rooted in sectarian identities will harden over time, right? There's no way that Yemen, we all know, uh, the 1990s and the 2000s, Yemen wasn't Iraq or Lebanon, right? The, these sectarian identities were just not important. But I think there's a risk, right, that as the conflict plays out, if it continues long term, that you're going to see the importation of that uh, kind of ideology from uh, the northern part of uh, the Muslim world in a very dangerous way into Aden that I think will continue to drive the conflict. Look, if it could have been resolved two years ago, a year ago, I think we could all imagine that easily you could go back to a kind of non-sectarian politics within Yemen. The risk is higher today. Obviously, if, if the fighting keeps going for another two to three years, I think that it's even higher. What I'd like, I want to ask Luca, and then as I said, the others, maybe you could address this. When you when you distinguish Jerudi from that element of Zaydism that um, uh, followed the, the line of Shokani and others, you know, that was much more about reconciling with Shafi in Yemen, um, how do you evaluate the uh, percentage increase of that thinking and, and support for sort of Jerudi ideology in the northern regions? Has it been, is there evidence that it's been going up and up and that more Zaidi are buying into that way of thinking and that there's a risk that that'll become, because it wasn't the dominant trend in, in the past. Uh, Ashokani's ideas were much more common among Zaidi. Luca. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so firstly, um, I'd like to say that I completely agree with Nadwa. Um, the Houthi anti-imperialist discourse is completely phrased in religious terms. So whenever they say that they are opposing the United States of America, they would also say that they are opposing the Christians or the Jewish lobbies behind the government in the United States of America. And whenever they say that they are opposing Israel, even when they use the term Sahiuni, Zionists, indeed, they also refer to the Jews. Um, but I think that somehow the English word sectarianism is confusing in a sense because we are using it both to cover the religious language that the Houthis are using for uh, groups that they consider outside of their religion, like the Christians and the Jews. And uh, the same term is used to describe the internal factions of one religion. So in Arabic, for instance, we would talk about madhabiyya to distinguish these internal fractures between different schools of uh, the Islamic religion. But in English, we didn't have a word to talk about that. So the Houthi discourse is inherently religious, yes, even when it's anti-imperialist. Uh, talking about the Jarudi school and uh, the, the percentage of moderate Zaydis in the North, uh, this goes back to my previous uh, discourse. What I meant to say is that given that uh, the Houthis are referring to a wide number of topics and some of these topics are political, even though phrased in religious terms, some of the people in the North, they are just buying the political part of their discourse. Some other people instead, they are adopting their sectarian discourse uh, or their esoteric discourse. And there are many degrees. I even heard people saying that Abdul Malik Al Houthi would be the Mahdi, the hidden Imam. I even heard, right, uh, I've seen people um, saying that uh, Sunni believers, uh, whenever they use the Dhamma while praying or they say Amin, they are not uh, Muslims. Okay, and this is not typical. Uh, of the Zaydi school, of course, but I don't even know if it's typical of the Jarudi school. I mean, this is a way of turning other Muslim believers into infidels, kuffar. 
uh, I don't know how widespread is this way of thinking right now in northern Yemen. Uh, I'm afraid that somehow it, this way of thinking was uh, yes, strengthened uh, by the fact that some of the Houthi supporters uh, think have this kind of mindset. Anybody else want to comment? Just I mean to address the um, uh, question coming from Stephen. Um, I think there is a, I mean, the, the difference between Jarudiya and uh, Suleimaniya, which is related to Shaukani, um, is related to the vision of the uh, head of Ummah or Al Imam. Um, according to Jarudiya school, they said yeah, it's, it should be from the prophetic uh, uh, family, it should be Hashimi. So this is something important. And that's why actually the uh, uh, Abdul Malik Al Houthi and I mean I mean uh, and and his family is trying actually to be in this line because this has given them superpower, and on the other side for for uh, Shaukani it's as you mentioned it's near to Shafi'i school and so many actually Zaidi Imams in Yemen said no Shaukani is just uh, 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 trying to to bring the Zaidi school to be uh, a part of of a Shafi'i school and he is not Zaidi uh, uh, anymore. And this is actually, actually something not new in Yemen. There are so many actually disputes between the two schools over the past uh, uh, century. Um, and the, the other point related to how this kind of, of uh, religious vision created um, common, let's say, common ground uh, of co collaboration between uh, Zaydi Jaroudi and, and Shia Twelvers because they have the same similarities. And from here, we can understand why today in Yemen, because of the conflict and because of the Iranian influence, there are huge, actually, Iranian uh, ideas uh, among the, 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 the Zaydi communities. And we cannot sometimes distinguish what is uh, uh, Zaydi and what is coming from the Shia 12 verse, because they are the same. And they are actually uh, trying to, to foster this kind of, of religious concepts. And I think by time pass, we will have uh, the same, the same, uh, let's say, the same uh, version of um, some groups in Iraq and some groups in Lebanon and in, 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 in Yemen, because we are seeing transformation of Zidi school to be uh, a part of, of, of Shia school. Actually, in Iraq, you will see uh, the Houthis conducting quite a lot of outreach. Um, in the shrines, essentially making the case that they have rejoined the wider Twelver community and, and highlighting the fact that they are celebrating Al Ghadir and making it, uh, you know, celebrating that in Sanaa. Um, and, you know, people will come up quite excitedly and, and take the view that they have switched path, as it were. So, so interestingly, it's a, it's a quiet component of their diplomacy um, mm -hmm. that they make more ground with than they used to. But personally, I mean, I, I, listening to this, I thought it was uh, fascinating and uh, uh, the sort of discussion I've not heard anywhere else. It's, uh, so I think we actually we, uh, we are making a contribution and I hope that the people who are seeing this video will, 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 will think that we have.